Good evening everyone, oh, whatever time it is when you're watching this, it's really good to be back with you today. So we're going to carry on um, with our series on perseverance and our focus today will be on persevering in obedience. So it's interesting in the lyrics that Nathan just read that um, saying uh, Jesus calling up people um, who will follow his call, I think that's what it said more or less, which is really what we're looking at today. So we're going to go back to the book of Hebrews, and um, if you were with me uh, last time, you might recall that one of the main reasons this book was written was to encourage a group of Jewish Christians to keep pressing on in the faith, despite the fact that they were facing trials of various kinds. The temptation for them to give up and to revert to Judaism was strong. So although the trials that we face are different and the temptation to give up takes different forms for us. The underlying message is as relevant now as it was then. So last time I spoke, I picked up on three very different ways that the writer to the Hebrews used to encourage the people. And just in case you can't remember what those were, let me refresh your memory. So first then was the fact that being convinced of the truth of the things that we confess is one of the keys to laying a strong foundation so that when we are faced with times of trial, we can stand strong. So we need to be prepared to engage our minds and dig deep into the truth of God's word. Second, we saw that in Hebrews, we see some of the strongest warnings against the dangers of slipping away. If we fall into a life of persistent disobedience, we demonstrate that we don't love God. And if we don't love him, we show that we are not his children. And the ultimate consequence of this is separation from him. And we remember that this wasn't written to bring us to a place of fear, but it was written so that we would guard against complacency. And then third, we were reminded of the importance of meeting together. Verses 23 to 25 of chapter 10 say this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. So, let's stir ourselves again to encourage and support one another, so that we won't grow weary and lose heart, but instead will grow in strength and maturity. But let's make a conscious effort to be aware of each other so that we can draw one another back if someone starts to slip away. And let's look out for ourselves too and remember that we do have an enemy who wants to break us away to a place of vulnerability. And let's not give him the chance. So that was last time. Today, as I say, we're going to look at persevering in obedience. And I want to do this under three headings. First, then, persevere in obedience. Second, persevere by faith. And third, persevere for the sake of reward. And I'm going to draw these from the example given in Hebrews of Abraham, as we read in chapter 11, and verses 8 to 16. So let me start by reading that passage to you. By faith... Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to that city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died, that's all the people that are referred to in this whole chapter, not having received the things promised, 
But having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But, as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So by faith, Abraham obeyed. Obedience. I wonder what feelings that word arouses in you. I'd be willing to bet that for most of us, it's not our favourite word. Not a word with the loveliest of connotations. I suspect the truth is that most of us, for most of us, the necessity to obey is something we could happily do without. We don't really love to obey. And the reason for this is that it strikes at the heart of our independence. To obey means first to recognise someone else as having the right of authority over us. And then a willingness to submit to that authority. And the reality is that we to prefer to recognise and submit to our own authority. We prefer autonomy and independence. And in this, we follow our culture. We see it all around us, the desire for self-determination, for self-rule. But actually, it isn't anything new. It's always been the same ever since Adam and Eve decided to follow their own desire rather than submit to God's authority. They chose to believe that they knew best, and so they disobeyed God's command. And mankind has been doing the same ever since. But as Christians... We are called to be different. Obedience is the key to Christian living. It is about aligning our will with the will of God. Acknowledging that he knows best despite what we feel or think. And then willingly submitting to him. The last of Jesus' words recorded by Matthew were a command to the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. John 15, Jesus said to the disciples, if they loved him, they would obey his commands. In Matthew 16, he tells them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For the Christian, there is no place for autonomy or self-law. We are called to submit completely to Jesus, to relinquish control, to follow and to obey. And this is hard. It costs. Look at Abraham here in this passage. Abraham was called to leave Ur, where he lived. And go out to the place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. He went to live in a foreign land as an exile, living in tents as a stranger. Now, Ur, archaeologists tell us, was a very prosperous and comfortable city. Very advanced for its time. And of course, Abraham's family and friends were there. It was a secure and comfortable and familiar. It was home. But God called him to go, and he went. And he spent the rest of his life living as a nomad. He spent the rest of his life waiting for the fulfilment of God's promise. Now, we know he did eventually have a son, but that was it. It was many generations after his death that his descendants moved into the land that God had promised Abraham. But despite all of this, Abraham didn't turn back and was specifically told that he could have done he would have had the opportunity to return. But instead, he carried on. He persevered in obedience. And we're called to do the same. The example of Abraham is given for our encouragement and instruction. We are called to persevere in obedience. And just as there was a cost for Abraham, there will usually be a cost for ourselves. That cost might be material, or physical, or financial, or emotional. 
It might be a cost of time or of effort. But underlying all of these, there is the cost of bending our will. Our will that prefers to go its own way. Our will that naturally does go its own way. This will needs to be bent back to going God's way. And as long as we remain in these mortal bodies, this is going to be a battle. But it's a battle that we must continue to fight as long as we have breath. And one day, it will become the most natural thing in the world. In the meantime, we need to persevere. So, are there specific things that God has called you to? And if so, are you still walking in obedience to that call? Perhaps, like Abraham, you started out in obedience, but the call came a long time ago, and you haven't seen any fruit. And perhaps you're wondering whether it's really worth carrying on trying. Maybe you're thinking about giving up. Maybe you already have. I don't know. And I don't know what those things might be, and I'm not going to try and speculate. If it is you, you will know. But if it is, please take this as an urgent call to pick it up and press on again. And it might help to tell someone else who can encourage and support you, someone who can hold you accountable. You see, it might seem like a waste of time and effort to us, but that's not the point. And we'll develop this in a moment, but the point is that we must trust God, that God knows what he is doing, and we need to submit to his greater understanding. So persevere in that which God has called you, despite what you might feel or think about it. And what if you don't feel that God has given you a specific call? Are you off the hook? Well, what do you think? All of the are uh, still apply. We have been given plenty of instruction in the Bible. And that's why it is important to persevere in reading it and studying it and taking it in. Because through doing this, we learn what the will of God is, what is close to his heart, what are the things that please him. At the very minimum, we can start with what Jesus described as the two greatest commands. To love God with all our heart, mind and strength, and to love our neighbours as ourselves. There's plenty enough to be getting on with that. We need to persevere in loving God even when times are hard and when God seems distant. Nathan talked recently about persevering in worship. There are times where we need to stir ourselves, when worship really is a sacrifice, to tell ourselves with David, Bless the Lord, O my soul. To declare with Habakkuk, that even though the harvest fails and everything goes wrong, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. And we need to persevere in loving our neighbours ourselves. And there are lots of ways we can do that. Keith spoke a couple of weeks ago about persevering in showing justice and mercy and faithfulness. This is a long-term commitment, day by day, year by year. And again, we might not see fruit. Our efforts might not be appreciated, but again... This isn't the point. The point is that in obeying these commands, we demonstrate our love for God and our trust in him. He knows what he is doing, even when we can't. And understanding this is really key to preser pres pres <laughs> preserving, <laughs> persevering <laughs> in obedience. And that's something I want to look at in more detail now. So we must persevere in obedience. But we must do this as we persevere by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Now I started with obedience, and this is my central point today, that we should persevere in obedience, that we should persevere in the Christian walk, persevere in following Christ. But the next two points we'll be looking at aim to put this obedience into some sort of context, so hopefully we understand it better and we'll be better equipped to sustain the life of obedience that we're called to. So then we turn to faith. It was by faith Abraham obeyed. And just as in the text faith comes first, so in practice faith must come first. James tells us that faith without works is dead. Or we could say that faith without obedience is dead. But equally, obedience without faith is dead. Obedience without faith is just us doing works. And our works can never be sufficient. Obedience without faith is just us following rules. It's mechanical and joyless and ultimately fruitless. 
Without faith, we're told earlier in the chapter, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, our works are a dead legalism. But with faith, it's a very different story. Obedience that follows faith is a joyful heart response to the love of God and results in life. Whereas the first is rooted in us and our efforts, the second is rooted in God and what he has done. Obedience that follows faith is a demonstration of our love for God. And so obedience that follows faith is what God delights in. Obedience is an aligning of our will with the will of God, an acceptance that he knows best, a demonstration that we believe that he is trustworthy. When I started talking about obedience, I suggested that for many of us it has negative connotations. We don't generally like being told what to do. We don't generally like submitting ourselves to someone else's authority. And I think that we, and certainly I include myself, at some level bring these feelings about obedience into our attitudes of obedience to Christ. But of course, how we feel about obedience crucially depends on who we are being asked to obey. And that is why it's so important to understand that faith must come first, because faith is rooted in the person and character of God. And this changes everything. So we should spend just a few moments reminding ourselves of what, biblically speaking, faith is. Well, from this chapter we see that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the assurance of things unseen. So the first thing we note here about faith is that it isn't the same as wishful thinking or optimistic hopefulness. It's described by words like substance, assurance, conviction. It isn't something nebulous and intangible, it's something solid and dependable. Then we see what faith is about. It's an assurance, a conviction of the truth of things we can't see. It's a belief in an unseen current reality, and it's a belief in a future unseen reality. But most important, we see that faith has its root in God himself. In verse 6 we read, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. So first here, we see that faith depends on a belief in God, which for today we'll take as read. The second, we see that faith is a trust in a God who is faithful to his promises, a God who is good, a God who rewards. And this isn't a trust that is groundless. God has been demonstrating his love and goodness and faithfulness right through history. And of course, we always come back to the supreme demonstration of his love when he sent Jesus to live amongst us as a man and to die for us on the cross. As Paul says in Romans 8, if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? When God raised Jesus from the dead, he demonstrated that not only has, does he have the um, will to love us, but he has the power to back that up. God is there, he loves us, and he has the power to be faithful to his promises. This is a God we can trust, and this is the ground of our faith. And understanding this is crucial to us persevering in obedience, because the bottom line is that obedience often isn't easy. And we may well be asked to do things that we don't understand and don't want to do, and may never live to see the benefit of, just as was the case with Abraham. Think of a child being told by a parent to eat her vegetables. Why she protests? Cabbage and broccoli taste horrible. What good can possibly come of eating them? I don't want to do it. And perhaps she's too young to understand about nutrition and health, so we say, just do what I tell you. We expect the child to trust that we know what is good for her. And the more the child loves and trusts her parents, the more easy it will be for her to comply. And so it is with us. Often the things that we are asked to do are hard and don't make sense to us. So the first one that came to my mind when I was thinking about this was the command to love our enemies and do good to those who hurt us. And we protest and ask, why? What possible good can come of doing that? 
And most of us probably don't have the capacity to understand God's reason why. There's no suggestion that our love will necessarily change our enemies. And it will surely cost us to do it. So what's the point? I hope you might be able to think of some reasons, but you can see the point here. Ultimately, we will only be able to persevere in obedience if we love and trust the one who is giving the command. We have to trust that God knows what he is doing, even if we never get to see it or understand it ourselves. And the more we come to this place of childlike trust in our Father, the more our obedience will follow our faith. And this will be an obedience that delights our Father. And it will be an obedience that is sustainable. So we need to persevere in obedience. And we need to persevere in obedience by faith. And finally then, we need to persevere in obedience with the expectation of reward. So that's my third point. Persevere for the sake of reward. Abraham could have gone back. Verse 14 of our passage says, If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. Abraham could have returned to his home city, to the comfort and security of his own old life, but he didn't. He continued to live the life of a nomad, as in a foreign land. He persevered in obedience, despite the fact that for most of his life he saw no evidence of God honouring the promise he had made. As we saw earlier, he finally had a glimpse when he became a father at nearly 100 years old. But that was still a long, long way from seeing descendants as numerous as the stars. A long, long way from being a blessing to all the nations of the world. So what kept him going in his obedience? Well, faith, yes, we just looked at that. Abraham believed that God was good and that God was faithful to his promises. But we're told here about one particular promise that Abraham believed in. Abraham, along with the other people mentioned in the chapter, believed that God was bringing a kingdom, a better country, a heavenly one. And Abraham's eye was fixed on that goal. So verses 15 and 16, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And that promised future is for us too. And I had thought to spend some time talking about that heavenly kingdom, or what can I say, in just a few minutes. So at least let me ask you a few questions. First, do you believe it? Of course, we all know the proper answer is yes. But really, do you believe that after death you will live again in what the Bible describes as a most glorious place? Second, do you think about it? Do you let your biblically inspired imagination wonder what it will be like? And third, are you looking forward to going there? Does the prospect fill you with hope and desire and longing? And I hope that the answers to these questions are yes, yes, and yes. But if they're not, I want to challenge you today. Either to think about the questions, if you haven't thought about them already, or, if your answers aren't positive, to ask yourself, why? Because Abraham and all the others had their eyes fixed on the eternal kingdom, and it motivated and encouraged and inspired them. And the whole biblical narrative is pointing forward to this time. The inauguration of the kingdom is the consummation of God's plan. The New Testament writers looked forward to it and longed for it. Shouldn't we do the same? Before Steph and I went to India, we spent quite a bit of time studying the area we were going to live in on Google. And by the time we got there, we knew our way around that area better than quite a lot of the locals. Shouldn't we seek to know more about our eternal home and start to get excited about going there. So I think the sad truth is that some people are rather ambivalent about going to heaven because they have no real idea of what it is or what it'll be like. And what ideas they do have are often very inaccurate. 
So although I don't have time today to dig very deeply into this, I do just want to make a couple of quick comments on what I think are some of the main misconceptions about heaven, two of them. The first is this. We won't float around in some sort of ghostly body. We will have a new body. It will be a glorified body, but it will be a body. When Adam was made by God from the dust of the ground, God breathed into him and he became a living being. Spirit and flesh were joined together inextricably. When Jesus was raised from the dead, the first fruits, Paul says, of all who will be raised. And for first fruits, you could read prototype if you like. His glorified body left the tomb. There was no body in the tomb. The old one had been made new. And it walked and talked and ate fish. It bore the marks of his crucifixion. It was renewed, restored, glorified and wonderful. But it was recognisably his same body. If you look at the biblical depictions of people in the, in the Bible uh, that are uh, um, shown as being in heaven, whether that's in the parables that Jesus told or in Revelation or anywhere else, you will see people with voices and limbs and clothes and the ability to eat and think and sing. They are real people in real bodies. The second thing then is that we won't live in some sort of ethereal shadow land. When God made Adam, he made him to live on the earth, and God hasn't changed his mind. If you look at Revelation, you'll see that we don't go up to some kind of spirit land, we see that heaven comes down. God will make his dwelling place amongst us. The realm where God is and the place where we are will be joined together. We read in Romans 8 that all creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Why? Because then it will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When in Revelation Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. One of the all things is the earth. So when you envision, envisage heaven, start by thinking of earth. The, old earth, the, the, new, the new earth won't be exactly the same as this one, just as our glorified bodies won't be exactly the same as our current bodies. But like them, it will be recognisable. So think of the best things on earth. Maybe for you it's the beauty of a flower, the majesty of a mountain, the kindness of a stranger, the crunch of snow underfoot with a clear blue sky overhead. Whatever it might be for you, these are glimpses of a world that will one day be set free from its bondage to decay and restored to its full glory. And this is the place we will call home. And of course, permeating all of this will be the unhindered, unbroken, unbounded, unrestrained presence of God. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. The writer to the Hebrews talks about us entering into the place of rest. When we come into the presence of God, all longings and strivings will cease. We will be complete. We will be at peace. We will be home at last. Sometimes... I used to stand in the sun and I just enjoy feeling the warmth of the sun's rays on my body. And I imagine one day I will sense the glory and love and goodness of God in that same tangible way. And I can't wait. God calls us, his people, to persevere in obedience. But let's do that in faith, trusting in the goodness of and power of the one who has called us. And let us keep our eyes fixed on that goal. The reward of living in the immediate presence of our loving Heavenly Father in the glorious homeland that he is even now preparing for us. Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us not fall through disobedience. Rather, let us strive to enter that glorious rest.
we have a beautiful, glorious inheritance waiting for us. Let it excite and motivate and strengthen us as we keep pressing on.